Vitruvian Man by Leonardo da Vinci depicts the idealized human, eight heads high and with an arm span that exactly matches the height. At six foot five, or one meter 97 centimeters, I was already at the high end of the normal curve. But I have an arm span that's a full 15 centimeters wider than my height. And so I very much know that one size does not fit all. When I wanted to buy a shirt 10 years ago, I would go to a high street retailer that specialized in tall fitting clothing. And in my size, in a tall fitting, I might be able to choose between the white one, the blue one, and if I was lucky, the gray one. Today, I have online retailers who know my exact dimensions and can precisely create a shirt that will fit just me from 253 different fabrics, three different styles of sleeves, 15 collar styles, 10 different ways of finishing the cuffs, seven ways of finishing the front of the shirt, and 18 possible arrangements of pockets, four different ways of finishing the back, as well as three different ways of finishing the bottom, 41 different styles of buttons, 31 threads to sew those buttons on, and nine possible styles of contrast fabric using up to 352 different contrast colors. 693 trillion shirts that fit me precisely. In our healthcare system, in contrast, we are still designing the services that we provide largely around the Vitruvian patient, a health system that expects that people will fit right into the slot that we have designed for them, where we provide a similar service for multiple different people and where we recommend an intervention which they will then follow, leading to a positive health outcome. When it comes to implementing good health advice, it turns out things aren't nearly so simple. Eat more fresh fruit and vegetables is a message we've all clearly heard. And yet, for many reasons, people don't always follow the recommended diet and exercise that health professionals have been telling them about, even when they actually want to improve their health. Likewise, people are unlikely to take the medications they're prescribed often, and we don't necessarily do the exercise that has been recommended to us to rehabilitate specific injuries. Every person is different, and we need to recognize that in the way that we deliver our health services. In fact, the idea of personalized healthcare has become a rallying cry focusing specifically on the idea that by analysing your genome we could find out about the way that you're wired so that medications could be prescribed for you that are effective or more effective and that interventions can be well tailored to your physiology. But there's a much more important element to personalising healthcare that we need to pursue and that's putting the person truly at the centre of the health system and understanding them and their needs and the way that they are approaching their life in the context of their family and their friends and their community. We've put far too much focus on specific solutions such as treatment interventions, medications and other evidence-based approaches that we know, if followed, will lead to a positive health outcome. But we need to now recognise the amount of focus that needs to be put on the problem of why do people not pursue these things when they're recommended. Recently, I dislocated my knee. A painful experience and one I was certainly motivated to get assistance with. And yet it took me a number of days to go and see my GP. And over a month before I followed up the referral to the physiotherapist that I'd been given, not because I was uninterested in getting treatment, but because of simple difficulties with scheduling, remembering to make a phone call to book an appointment during working hours, and then working out the basic transportation issues associated with getting to somewhere that wasn't part of my normal routine. During that delay, I further injured my knee, complicating the picture. These are the kinds of things that we need to be increasingly focused on. Interestingly, new technologies are now giving us far more information about these everyday behaviours. I'm hoping next time I go and see my GP that she asks me what my average heart rate has been because I'll be able to gleefully give her the last 600 measurements that my watch has collected over the preceding four days. Well, whether it's that data or something else, increasingly as consumers, we are becoming empowered with knowledge about what's really going on for us in our pursuit of health and wellness. And the prompts that we may get from that are likely to be able to lead to positive behavior change. 
I suspect this is going to lead to a crisis of confidence for health professionals who are going to be confronted with data about their individual patients telling them that we're not always doing the things that we've been recommended to do. Once we get over this crisis though, I believe that this will refocus our health system on its primary role, which is not merely designing and recommending health interventions, but is focusing itself on being an enabler of positive behaviour change, that every health professional is first and foremost there to assist with changing the behaviour of the clients that they work with. In this way, we're not just focusing on the main ingredient of good health, but all of the ingredients that together come to produce the recipe for health and wellness. With this combination of new technology empowering consumers, clear feedback on behaviour, refocusing health professionals on what their true role is, I believe that the century ahead has the potential to see a dramatic shift towards improved health and wellness statistics. And that's a change that I'm looking forward to.